Next, you need to address the physical aspect. This is where you apply these three rules, focus, repetition, and feedback, to actually learn to apply the understanding that you have just learned to the physical act of execution. <laughs> Technique is something we all want to improve. It is something we require to play our instrument to a high level, and it is something many of us dedicate many hours of practice to. However, it can be very difficult to understand exactly how to go about this, how to balance it with learning other things. Perhaps we think we should also be practicing repertoire or learning songs or practicing specific fills or learning that particular passage from the grading book. There are a million and one things to divide our time when practicing an instrument. And it can be very difficult to know how much time to dedicate towards practicing specifically technique and how to actually go about practicing technique. So today I'm going to share a few thoughts, a few ideas and explore the concept of practicing technique. <laughs> First of all, I think it's very important to understand that the most important aspect in technique is not developing muscle memory or anything like that, it is in developing understanding. So everything we do when it comes to learning and practicing technique is aimed towards improving our understanding of what it is we're trying to do. Whether that is the most fundamental stroke on the drum or the most advanced rudiment you can think of, we need to understand precisely what we are doing, what we are supposed to be doing, and how we are going to go about doing it. Without the understanding, all of the work we do is just going to be wasted because we don't really understand what it is we're trying to do. Now, when we apply this to something like drumming, when we take a single stroke roll or a double stroke roll or a buzz roll, which often trips a lot of people up, we, we like to think that practicing technique is as simple as putting on the metronome and spending half an hour on the pad tapping away. And yes, there is place for that. That is an important part of it, but that must come after we fully understand what it is we are trying to do. Before we start that process, before we start dedicating time and investing energy into the process of actually physically practicing, we need to be very clear in our own minds what we are trying to achieve, how we are going to achieve it, and how everything synergizes with our hands, with our fingers, with our wrists and the sticks to produce what it is we are actually trying to produce. For me, this journey was most obvious with learning double stroke rolls. Over the years, I practiced double stroke rolls a lot and I changed my technique a lot. I altered my grip, I altered my fingers, my wrists, the angle at which I held the sticks. All of these things in an attempt to improve my technique. And despite the hundreds if not thousands of hours I put into practicing it, the one thing I kept on missing was a full understanding of how a double stroke roll actually works. Now the double stroke roll is just an example here, but it highlights what I'm talking about. Without me fully understanding how the double stroke roll works, I was never going to learn it because I didn't know what I was doing, despite all the time I was actually investing into practicing it. <laughs> I consider it to be a multifaceted approach that is ultimately holistic. What does that mean? Well, that means we can't just take double stroke rolls, for example, in a vacuum and think, I want to improve my double stroke roll, so I'm going to practice double stroke roll. I don't think it works like that. Think about language, think about how we talk, and think about how we produce music in a linguistic sense. We combine vocabulary and language together. We don't just play double stroke roles. We don't just use one technique. We use our entire bodies. We use different parts of our minds, our ideas, our concepts to express what it is we're trying to play. So we need to contextualize technique in the same way. How can I understand a double stroke roll? Let's stick with double stroke rolls as an example, but please apply this to whatever it is you're trying to improve. How can I, how can I understand a double stroke roll? Well, first of all, we of course have to discover what is happening physically. So from a double stroke roll perspective, I know that I need to produce two, two strokes on each hand. 
Now, unfortunately, there are a myriad ways that we can actually do this. We can bounce them. We can use all wrist. We can use all fingers. We can use various iterations of drop catch. We can use a million different ways to produce a double stroke roll. So what do we do? Which one do we practice? Well, ultimately, we need to invest the time to find out for ourselves so that we know the difference. It is one thing going to a teacher, it is one thing listening to me on the internet, but it is quite another to spend time with your sticks in your hands actually doing it. Now, I said at the beginning of this video, don't just stick the metronome on and start doing this. <laughs> Because that's mindless. That's not actually exploring. That's not learning. That is not helping you in any way. But what we can do is treat this first step like an experiment, like a laboratory endeavor, right? We're trying to understand more about our hands. What is my fulcrum doing here? What are my fingers doing? What are my wrists doing? So when I try and produce a double stroke, Okay, what did I do? What have my fingers done? What position has my hand come into? Did that feel comfortable? What if I change the fulcrum to my index finger and use more of my middle finger? What if I remove my index finger from the stick so that the fulcrum is on the middle finger? Now that felt a bit tense and I felt like I lost a little bit of control there. So what if I use the thumb in between those two front fingers? Now I've started to develop a drop catch. Do I want a drop catch? Well, can I alternate a drop catch? Yes, I can, but it's not necessarily practical. What if I try using just my fingers to produce both strokes? Well, in order to do that, I'm having to employ my wrists. All of these thoughts, all of these explorations, are you actually becoming familiar with what it takes to physically produce what it is you're trying to produce, right? I'm learning not just to play a double stroke role, but I'm learning about the double stroke role. I'm learning about the role of my fulcrum. I'm learning about the role of my fingers, the role of my wrist, the role of my arms. And this is where having a teacher, I think, is very important. This is where it really helped me because I could say to my teachers, what's your fulcrum doing? Are you tense or are you relaxed? Are you on the index finger or are you on the middle finger? How much fingers should I be using here? And they would guide me. They would give me things to think about. They would unlock the doors that would allow me to keep exploring so that I'm not reliant on a teacher. I understand for myself intimately. I'm very familiar with all of the different ways that my fingers, my wrist, my fulcrum affect the stick. So that when I come to play and practice a double stroke roll, I'm armed with enough conceptual information to actually use my time wisely. We know from neurological studies that if we want to learn something and improve our efficiency at performing it, we essentially need three things. We need repetition, we need focus, and we need feedback. This is why I always practice in front of a mirror. So let's assume we've done a little bit, a little bit of that conceptual legwork. How do we apply these three aspects to help us best practice the physical aspect of the technique we are trying to learn? Well, let's start with the middle one, focus. This is the one that a lot of people often neglect. They think, well, repetition, let's just stick the TV on and let's tap away on the pad for an hour while I'm watching a film. That's not going to work because you're missing one of the key ingredients, focus. Repetition without focus is time wasted. So focus, what are we trying to achieve? What am I looking for? What am I doing? How am I doing it? All of these things we can focus on but scientific studies suggest it actually doesn't matter what we focus on as long as we're focusing. When we are focusing on what we are doing, perhaps watching your stick, keeping an eye on your angles, if you're in the mirror, watching your stick heights and making sure your arms match, the act of consciously focusing tells your brain, tells your neurological system, including your nervous system, this is important. It's important pay attention because I'm going to be doing a lot of it and we need this to improve. It literally 
switches your brain into learning mode. The act of focus is what tells your brain, hey, pay attention, this is important. So I like to do this in front of a mirror. Perhaps you can do this too. If you don't have a mirror, you can find something else, but you need to be watching. You need to be actively paying attention to what you are doing, making lots of different corrections. Are my hands of a good angle? Maybe my right hand is sticking out here and I've not realized it. Perhaps my left hand is coming in at a different angle to my right. Maybe my fulcrum has pivoted so my thumb is on top. All of these things we are just paying attention to, telling our brain, giving it the instructions, hey, correct that. Pay attention to that and fix it. Because we can't control our muscles directly. We give the intent and our brain controls the muscles. So we need to tell it, hey, that's good, that's bad. So now we come to feedback. We can have feedback from a teacher or we can have feedback from ourselves. If we have done that conceptual legwork of understanding what a double stroke roll should be like, we can provide real-time direct feedback to, ourself, to ourselves by cross-referencing the stroke we have just done with what we want it to be like or how we wish it should be or how we think it should be. So maybe I'm playing a double stroke roll like this. <laughs> And I see in the mirror, or my camera viewfinder, that my left hand has pivoted. Well, if I'm paying attention, if I'm focusing, I would notice that, and I would twig in my mind, hold on, my left hand is at an odd angle. I need to resume and match my right hand. And that's feedback. That is providing feedback to my neurological system, my nervous system, my brain, saying, no, we don't want that, that's bad, change it. And then, when we enact that change, we come back to here, we can mentally, because we are focusing, say, yes, that is what I want my hands to look like. And your brain knows that. Your brain is an incredibly powerful tool that knows how to do this effect and knows how to affect this change, knows how to make that change and make it stick. So now, finally, we come to the process of repetition. I've focused, I'm giving myself or I'm receiving real-time feedback now I repeat. So two things to say here on the process of repetition. Number one, it must never be mindless. I must maintain focus and I must keep giving real-time feedback. So all of the while that I'm playing this repetition, I'm watching myself. making small corrections, adjusting my posture, ad adjusting my angle, trying to match my left hand to my right. Now I'm trying to do this from five feet away looking in my camera viewfinder, but you get the idea. This real-time feedback and correction must be maintained to keep the repetition actually valuable. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the repetition must not be endless. We need to set goals and we need to set little ways to keep ourselves focused. Because if I just say, oh, sod it, I'm going to go for an hour, I can guarantee you, you will lose focus within that hour and you will waste probably 40, 50 minutes of that hour. It is far better to do a five minute focus segment than it is to do an hour where your mind wanders and you stop um, giving yourself feedback. So what I like to do is use a series of games with uh, miniature targets, with miniature goals. So what I might do is set the tempo to 50 BPM, just, as, just as a, uh, to pull a figure out of thin air. And I might do one minute, let's say, or 100 bars of repetition. I think it's better to work with repetition um, numerically than temporally, but it doesn't really matter. So let's just say I'm going to do 100 bars at 50 BPM. <laughs> And I do those 50 bars, keeping track of everything I'm playing, keeping track of my focus, giving that real-time feedback and all of that. And then I get to that 100 bars. Maybe it's taken me two or three minutes. That's about right. That's good. We can pause. We can reflect. And then we can increase the tempo, maybe by 2 BPM, something like that, and do it again. And we want to just set a number of a number of sets that we want to achieve. So maybe throughout our practice session, we want to do five sets. And throughout those sets, we're going to increase by two BPM each time, giving us a total increase of 10 BPM. Because if we start at 50 BPM, I do five sets, increasing two each time, I'm going to end up at 60 BPM. And then when we get to 60 BPM, we've finished. 
There comes a point beyond which the diminishing returns are too great. It's just simply not worth pushing any further. Beyond a point, your focus is going to disappear. So keep it short and sweet and specifically frequent. So you might do five sets in the morning, five sets again in the afternoon, and then the same again the next day, and then maybe have a break, and then the same again the day after. It is the frequency of reinforcement that is going to solidify the process you're doing here. Maybe the first day you do five sets covering 50 to 60, the second day 60 to 70, or maybe 55 to 65, doing it in small increments. But remember, the point here is not the tempo. The point here is to simply maintain your focus because you need to rack up all of those repetitions. That is the second rung of our technique ladder. We've encountered the conceptual exploration where we're learning about the technique. We've now started applying some repetition, some focused feedback-based repetition to give us the actual physical ability to start executing this. Now we need to take that non-contextual work and contextualize it. And this is again a step I feel many people neglect and that is to start learning repertoire. Now, this is why I wrote these books, because I wanted to produce some repertoire, specifically in, in Virtuoso, that encouraged technique. This one is not about technique. That one is just compositions. But Snare Drum Virtuoso is all about using repertoire in a specific way that encourages the use of technique. So this is where you stop just playing a double stroke roll and stop conceptualizing a double stroke roll. <laughs> as that and you start seeing it as a tool to be applied. We might come across a passage that has whatever. It's something I, something I just made up. But all of that was using double stroke rolls in different ways. And when you encounter that in the repertoire and you are forced to learn it, all of that legwork we've done on those first two rungs of the ladder, we are now applying it. And that is expanding our learning, that is expanding our understanding. Remember I said all of this is holistic. And crucially, it is expanding our technical ability to execute the motions we have been practicing in different contexts applying them to different contexts. And that is absolutely vital because we very, very rarely, if ever, simply play a double stroke roll like that. That's just an exercise. That is not how it appears in the repertoire. That's not how we play it on the drum kit because it doesn't have any musical value outside of some very specific circumstances. I like to mix up all of these approaches. If I know that I have a weakness in my technique, then I need to, that I need to improve for the, po for the purpose of performance or something like that. I will break it down into these three ways. My conceptual understanding, my physical execution, and my contextual application. And I try and divide my time between all three of these depending on where I feel I'm strongest and weakest. So just finishing, uh, sticking with this double stroke roll to finish, we begin by making sure we understand on an intellectual level exactly how a double stroke roll is produced. What should my fulcrum be doing? What should my fingers be doing? What should my wrists be doing? How do I actually produce the stroke? This is where you might need a teacher or guidance from somebody with more experience to give you insights. That doesn't mean blindly follow what they tell you. It means take what they tell you and apply it to your own understanding. A common theme here is where you get uh, contrasting information from different sources of authority. Well, drummer X says always use an index finger fulcrum. Drummer Y says never use an index finger fulcrum, use a middle finger fulcrum. I trust both of them. What do I do? Learn both. Learn both and see what you think. Part of taking technique and becoming an expert in your own field is in taking that authority, taking that responsibility and applying it to yourself. Okay, that person thinks that. Why do they think that? This person disagrees and thinks that. Most importantly, what do I think? Where do I think the fulcrum should sit? What does it mean to me if I use a middle finger fulcrum compared to an index finger fulcrum? 
And then you can cross-reference that against other teachers, your friends and colleagues, other musicians, and see what you think and build up this understanding over the course of a period of time. You're not just going to do this in a practice room isolated from the world. Next, you need to address the physical aspect. This is where you apply these three rules, focus, repetition, and feedback to actually learn to apply the understanding that you have just learned to the physical act of execution. Finally, perhaps the most important step is learning to apply it musically. Remembering that your technique is just a tool, whether it's a double stroke role or otherwise, nobody wants to see you or listen to you just play a double stroke role but they might want to see you play a John Pratt solo, which requires a double stroke roll. They might want to see you play something on the drum kit that happens to require a double stroke roll. So it's very important that you take that last step. So how might I do this? Well, I always make sure that I understand what I'm doing. I'm always asking questions about my technique. Am I happy with my angle? Am I happy with my fulcrum? What if I adjust my fulcrum like this? Always asking these questions to keep myself learning about the technique itself. Then, I will certainly do some exercise time, especially if I'm learning a piece that's very difficult. Maybe I will just take a one or two bar segment and I will apply these steps to repetition. And maybe I will try and do half an hour, an hour, something like that with breaks to keep myself focused. So I might just take this one bar. Uh, no, what I actually do is I take one bar and I alternate it with another bar and I might do 100 repetitions of that and then 100 repetitions of this up the tempo of both of them, a hundred more and a hundred more. And constantly switching between the two, it keeps me engaged, it keeps me focused, and I'm focusing on one very small act of execution. Then, and this is probably where I spend the most of my time these days, I'm learning repertoire that requires this technique. Finally, I'll leave you with an example. Many years ago, when I was predominantly a drum kit player, I spent a long, long time learning to play a clave on my left foot and to try and play everything I could on top of that on the drum kit. And I got to the point at my peak in this period where I could quite comfortably keep a left foot clave on the hi-hat and play anything I liked with the hands in my bass drum. Over, over the years, it occurred to me that I'd never once used it. I'd never been called upon to use it professionally. I never played it on stage and I very, very rarely used it in my own playing. And that was an example where I had learned a technique just because I felt I should, rather than having some particular reason and treating it like a tool to be applied to all musical areas. Now that's just a little example to get you thinking. We can't learn everything. We must have a good reason to learn it. I'm not going to dedicate much more time, at least at the moment, to, learn in Latin, to learning Latin drum kit playing, claves and coordination and things like that, when my immediate work over the next year or so is on the snare drum. I need to focus on the things I'm doing here. So always make sure you've got this reason. You're giving yourself a reason to practice what you're practicing because you've only got so many hours in your life to dedicate to music practice. Let's make them count. So I hope this has given you some things to think about. I'm really, really interested in theories of practice and things like this. So please get in touch with me if you'd like to discuss it further, either in a lesson or just informally. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and very best of luck in your own practice. Keep striving. Good luck. Thank you very much. See you next time.